and welcome to today's webinar. Thank you for joining the Society for the Psychological Study of Social Issues for our presentation on anti-fat and weight bias, addressing myths and creating justice through research and policy. My name is Sarah Mancall, I'm SPICI's Policy Director. And if you're not yet familiar with SPICI, we're also known as Division Nine of the American Psychological Association. A few quick logistical points before we get started today. On your screen, you should see and be able to hear from all of today's panelists. Since, since this is a Zoom webinar, attendees are in view and listen only mode, but that said, we would love to hear your questions. So please type them into the chat and we will answer as many questions as we can get to today. I would also like to mention that today's webinar is being recorded and will be posted on SPICI's YouTube channel afterward. Please note that only the speaker's video and audio feeds will be shared afterward, not anything from the chat. And now on to today's panelists. We have Dr. Paula Brochu, an associate professor in the Department of Clinical and School Psychology at Nova Southeastern University in Florida. A social psychologist by training, she studies weight bias or negative attitudes, beliefs, and behaviors directed to fat people and those who live in larger bodies. Specifically, she examines the processes underlying the expression of anti-fat bias the consequences of weight stigma on health and well being, and the efficacy of interventions to reduce weight bias. Next, we have Stephanie Campbell, who is a doctoral student in school psychology at the University of Wisconsin Madison School of Education. Stephanie's research interests focus on social justice, culturally responsive practice, intersectionality, body image, and weight bias. She is fascinated by how the intersection of weight status heritage, culture, race, socioeconomic status, and gender impact the mental health and well-being of young people. Dr. Jeffrey Hunger is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychology at Miami University of Ohio. His lab uses insights from social psychology to understand and ultimately improve the health of those encountering stigma, for example, higher body weight individuals and racial and sexual minorities and often examines the consequences of stigma through the theoretical lens of social identity threat. Next, we have Dr. Andrea Lamar, who is a lecturer in clinical health, critical health psychology at Massey University in New Zealand. Her research primarily focuses on eating disorders, body image and embodiment, often through story. She has conducted research at the intersection of weight stigma and reproductive health, and she's also interested in social justice informed approaches to research, treatment and advocacy in mental health. So thank you so much to all of our panelists today. And I will kick things off by asking the first question and maybe we can start with Dr. Brochu and, and go around. How did you get interested in anti-fat and weight bias research? Ah. So uh, for me, it was actually my undergraduate studies. It was a third year course that I took um, on research methods and stereotyping prejudice and discrimination research. And we read Chris Crandall's work on uh, anti-fat attitudes. And that was what really opened up my eyes to, this is a thing that researchers study. Um, and it led me to actually investigate that for my honors thesis. And then it was focused on uh, for grad studies. So for me, it was all about what happened for me in undergrad. Next, Stephanie Campbell. Yeah, I did not come into grad school knowing about this area of research or advocacy or activism, but um, tripped and stumbled into it. And I'm just so happy I did. So I had a friend recommend the podcast Food Psych to me, um, and it totally changed my life. It totally changed my perspective. It was things as a cisgender woman um, who's biracial. I had a lot of thoughts and feelings about bodies and, and bias, um, but I was never able to articulate them in like a scholastic sense. So finding Chris Christy Harrison's work kind of led to finding a bunch of other people and realizing it's really not happening in school psychology the way it should be. And Dr. Hunger? Yeah, so uh, unlike Paula, where her undergraduate thesis was like related to this, uh, my undergraduate thesis was about how people present themselves online in what is now a defunct website called MySpace. Folks out there may have heard of this. Um, so I was like really interested in uh, self-presentation and online impression management 
And then I read a paper by Rebecca, Rebecca Poole, this review paper that like sort of gave this overview of all that we know about weight stigma. And not a lot of it was focused on the health implications. And I was like blown away. And like, that was when it tripped it. It like flipped everything for me. Like plans changed for graduate school. I knew that that was kind of what I wanted to move my research interests into and start studying. And Dr. Lamar. I was actually thinking about how to answer this because I like, I'm not a hundred percent sure. I have to think that it was from my advisor from my master's and my PhD, Dr. Carla Rice, who does fantastic kind of radical um, fat studies, disability studies, all of this kind of stuff that really welcomes in difference as something to be centered rather than something to be othered. And I was doing eating disorder research and that was always my focus from a place of lived experience then moving into research and advocacy. And basically it became very clear that it was impossible to talk about eating disorders without talking about this kind of horrible fat phobic world that we live in um, and the kind of implications that that holds for people, particularly who don't fit stereotypes around what an eating disorder looks like. And so I have to credit, I think my advisor, Dr. Kyla Rice, for kind of welcoming me into this kind of world and starting to really mess up my understandings of bodies, I guess, in a great way. And for my next question, I'll kind of go backwards. Um, what are some of the main findings from your work? Can you tell us a little bit about your research? And I'll start with Dr. Lamar. All right, this one I feel um, a little bit more certain in answering, so that'll be helpful. Um, so the reason that I'm on this panel is particularly around a piece that I co-wrote with um, Dr. Rice and Dr. May Friedman and uh, Katie Cook um, around reproductive uh, justice and um, fatness. And basically that was based on a study that we were conducting around the experiences of people who had been seeking fertility or pregnancy care and had encountered um, weight bias at some point in that journey. So I think one of the most important things that I wanted to highlight today was just that we found that people did have quite negative experiences. And when they didn't have negative experiences, it was because they were quite strong in their advocacy for themselves and that's wonderful and it was fantastic to see people kind of you know asserting their um, brilliance in these spaces and not kind of being trampled on by providers and I think that really speaks to um, a strength but I also think that what this really drew our attention to was how they shouldn't have to um, and systems should be oriented toward welcoming in different bodies and allowing different bodies to exist in that space without over medicalizing and treating people like they are you know some kind of um, problem case um, because they exist in the world in a body that is larger than what was expected in that space. So that is probably like the main thing that I would want to highlight from that study. Obviously there were fantastic stories from our participants and I'm so grateful to everyone who participated in that study for sharing these experiences, which were often quite negative, but I really wanted to highlight that kind of, um, I guess, pull between the brilliance of the self-advocacy and the fact that that shouldn't need to exist um, within these systems. Yeah. And Dr. Hunger, can you tell us about your research and your findings? As always, I muted myself and was started talking. Uh, so a lot of my research really focuses on very broadly the mental and physical health consequences of uh, avoid stigma broadly, but in particular about this idea of how just merely anticipating weight stigma, um, what we call social identity threat, you know, seems to exert very similar effects as uh, just experiencing it directly. So in, in our work, we look at um, a whole host of mental and physical health consequences of anticipated weight stigma. Much more recently, we've been uh, really focused on thinking about how anticipated weight stigma relates to things that are really relevant to clinical outcomes. So we've been focused a lot more on interfacing with clinical psychology and thinking about depression and anxiety, but then also things like disordered eating and unhealthy weight control behaviors, as well as sort of risk factors that we know exist for, you know, un unhealthy weight control behaviors and disordered eating. So things broader like body dissatisfaction, body image disturbance, you know, drive for thinness, stuff like that. So we, we take a really broad approach in my lab, but it mostly falls under the umbrella of thinking through sort of the mental and physical health consequences of just merely anticipating weight stigma, even if you've not in, uh, experienced it yourself. And we know that folks you know, we, we live in a fat phobic society. So even if you haven't been a direct target of it, 
there's still plenty of reasons why folks might anticipate it because they, they have either seen folks around them encounter it. They have seen the ways in which fat people are represented in media and news and, you know, uh, other forms of sort of like uh, ways in which we're socialized. And so we're interested really broadly about like ways in which that seems to have similar health effects that, you know, might traditionally be um, looked at just with folks that are experiencing weight stigma directly. And Stephanie Campbell. As the baby scholar on this panel, I don't have uh, necessarily a ton of findings to report, but um, the things that have kind of got me going into this was looking at a bunch of school-based interventions and seeing, uh, looking for who's doing the intervention, what kind of things are they incorporating? Are they talking about weight bias? Um, the answer is no, they're not really talking about weight bias for the most part. They're not happening in the United States. They're mostly happening in um, Australia, the UK and Canada. Um, they tend not to involve the families, which as a school psychologist, we think a lot about the connection between family, community, and school. And this is a thing I see missing. I can definitely see from like a clinical psych perspective, it's like, oh, chaotic, like we don't want more variables. But I think if we're talking about intervention, families need to be involved. And they certainly need to be involved when we're thinking about a systemic injustice and this kind of bias that leads to poor mental health outcomes. So the thing where, where my findings will happen soon, hopefully in my dissertation is we're talking to teachers teachers about race and weight, and we'll be asking them to engage in a particular um, dialogue, a critical dialogic approach, kind of taken from intergroup dialogue from the 50s, and basically going to see through open-ended qual methodology, um, what are their thoughts? Like, how do they think, conceptualize identities of race and weight in their classroom? How do they talk about it with their students? That kind of thing. So um, it'll be a great exploration. I haven't seen a lot of information about teacher opinion. And I think the next stage is also school psychologist opinion. What are school psychologists trained to do? How are they prepared or not prepared? Because I know in my training program, we don't talk about eating disorders at all. Um, and so weight bias is certainly not even on the radar. And Dr. Brochu, can you tell us about your research and what some of your findings have, have led to? Sure. Uh, some of my early work has focused on the associations between implicit and explicit anti-fat attitudes, those underlying mechanisms that really relate to people expressing weight bias in our surveys and to other people. Um, also some work on the consequences of weight bias, specifically looking at weight-based stereotype threat, um, looking at how it can lead to non-support for policies that really, really matter and, and allowing for weight inclusive care. So for example, prejudice and negative attitudes towards higher weight people leads to support for policies that are discriminatory on the basis of weight and that restrict access based upon BMI, for example. Um, also very interested in reducing weight bias. So testing interventions to see just how we can do this when it works and why. So work out of my postdoc, looking at the common in-group identity model, work focused on bodies, so how a body gratitude intervention can help with reducing weight bias internalization. And then also I'm integrating my research and my teaching a lot. So being able to look at, okay, I teach about weight bias in my clinical and school psychology courses. Is it making a difference? Are students like hearing this information? Is it changing the way that they think about their clients on the basis of their weight? Um, Another piece of that is because I'm located in a department of clinical and school psychology is now my work is taking a lot of more clinical kind of focus with clinical uh, practical implications. So some of our latest work has looked at the associations between weight bias internalization and suicidality and also the role of weight bias in uh, working with patients with eating disorders and how that how a client's weight can really influence how a trainee is thinking about the presentation of eating disorder symptoms. Thank you. I think we're getting a ton of questions. So maybe I'll ask you one more of our prepared questions and then we'll jump over to the questions that are coming in because we have a lot coming in, which is great. And people keep sending them in and we'll answer as many as we can get to. Um, so my next question is, what would you like the public to know about anti-fat bias? And maybe I will start with Stephanie first. Um, kind of combining my pre-existing research interests with this new world of, of body stuff. Um, the thing I really continue to learn about and point out to people is that 
these norms of thinness are not only harmful on their own, but they're rooted in whiteness and they're rooted in anti-blackness and they're rooted in things that are larger systems of oppression, all combining in a really mean way. Um, so I think it's also something that affects everyone. You don't need to be fat. You don't have to have a, a body that doesn't fit the norm to experience the harmful effects kind of like um, the other panelists were saying. So just trying to see it as this complex, but also historically sociopolitically bound thing um, and how this bias is real and not just um, a social imperative to always try to be shrinking your body is the stuff I'm yelling about the most on the internet. And Dr. Lamar, what would you like the public to know about anti-fat bias? Um, so I think for me, this one is a question that I kind of have to answer in relation to the privilege that I take up in the world. So I exist in a body that is kind of, well, actually quite normative across all different um, spectrums. I'm white, I am in a thinner body, I am cisgender, all of these things that kind of make people listen to me. I also have a PhD and so people wanna to listen to me, but really I think what I want people to do is actually not listen as much to me and listen more to people who are telling their stories all the time, but that get horrible abuse um, and that get told that they couldn't possibly be telling the truth, that they couldn't possibly have a story to tell. And so I think, I guess, listen to people who identify as fat, listen to people who identify as being in a larger body, listen to people who are telling these truths, but that aren't getting the airtime that people might give um, to me when I say these sorts of things, like the fact that weight bias is causing a lot of harm. So yeah, I guess that's my, what I would say. And Dr. Brochu, the same question for you. What would you like the public to know? I guess I would just like the public to know that anti-fat anti bias is pervasive, it's harmful, and it doesn't have to be this way. Like, it's not okay, and let's do something else instead. Um, so that I really want fat people themselves to know that there's nothing wrong with you, that you're perfectly fine the way that you are, and that what matters is for you to be embodied in your own body, for you to care, your, care about yourself. Um, and part of this is because we live in such a fat phobic society is developing these coping skills to kind of protect ourselves against what's going on around us. But I also generally want to see there to be really big changes in how we think about weight, um, that it's not all about willpower. It's not a lifestyle factor. We need to be talking about these things differently. And Dr. Hunger, the same question for you. I mean, it's really hard to follow up on those three like fantastic responses other than just saying like, listen to these three, like just listen to what they're saying. Like, I really think that's an important thing to be doing. Um, beyond that, uh, the health implications of weight bias are real. They're measurable, they're there. Folks may not believe that, but it's true. Um, so that would probably be the one thing that I could add to this conversation. The other being when we have conversations about weight bias, and maybe this is more in this space here, maybe not the general public, we need to be centering fat people in terms of the consequences of a fat phobic society. Yes, it has implications for folks across the weight spectrum, but the folks that are most acutely targeted by it, the most acutely affected by it, the most structurally, uh, I'm trying not to swear, uh, um, uh, <laughs> Paula can see me like trying to like not say the F word, uh, most structurally disadvantaged uh, by living in a fat phobic society are fat people. And so one of the things that I worry about is that in conversations about weight stigma, that it sort of erases that differential across the weight spectrum. Like, like unfortunately, like things that like weight stigma awareness week with Nita, um, we saw this, we saw basically Nita erasing the sort of the structure of, uh, of sort of uh, the body hierarchy in our country by saying in their Weight Stigma Awareness Week like uh, announcement that weight stigma affects everyone. And it's like really this all bodies matter like sort of approach. And we can't have that. We can't have an all bodies approach matter right now, just like we can't have an all lives matter approach right now. And so thinking about who is most systematically oppressed by these structures in our society does not mean that that's the only people that are affected by it. That does not mean that other people that are thin or that are not necessarily, you know, uh, perceived as fat or identify as fat aren't affected. It's just really calling attention to that there's certainly a subset of our population, not even a subset, the majority of our population that are, you know, being the target of this sort of oppression. And so that would be that and listen to these three. 
All right, so now I'm going to jump into some of our questions. I'm going to kind of bounce around, but um, I saw one question in particular related to COVID that seemed especially timely, timely. There's a lot of talk now in medicine about how obesity increases the risk for COVID, um, which is problematic in many ways. As a social scientist working in medicine, this person, um, their criticism is often dismissed and they're really concerned about how this perpetuates weight bias in regard to the course of this deadly virus. Uh, what can we do about this? I know that's a big question. <laughs> I think the first step is to direct folks and friends and colleagues to the brilliant authors and activists who have written extensively about this online. I, I can't think of what outlet it's on, but um, Joy Cox and Christy Harrison and a few others got together and wrote a phenomenal piece earlier in the pandemic about how this uh, is not weight and all this kind of the citations and science behind that. And um, I think that's a place to start because sometimes people listen to data, but honestly, it's a, it's a matter of addressing the stigma that's at the root of it. Like no one wants to believe your data when they believe deep down in their soul that fatness is horrible and bad. And this is the worst thing you can be, right? So like um, it's the data plus trying to disrupt the bias and maybe point out why some of these structural issues like social determinants of health um, have a lot to do with these correlation only studies that happen um, that have nothing to do with causation. And that if you go deep in enough, some, a lot of times the studies themselves aren't citing reliable sources or making up things. I mean, it's, it's truly awful, but I would recommend if you're curious about some of the bad science, um, okay to be fat is a channel on YouTube where she streams herself trying to look for the, the science behind some of these claims and it is hilarious and never um, encouraging, but um, good for us because our argument becomes more valid when you see how um, medicine is really not rooting this stuff in good data. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. And I would follow up only to say too, like even if, this is a big old if, even if a, a study found a relationship between weight status and say COVID complications or COVID outcomes that glosses over all sorts of, like Stephanie said, sort of social determinants of those health outcomes. We know that the healthcare environment is a shit place for fat people. And so, you know what might lead to more complex cases of COVID? Not wanting to go to the doctor when you have the symptoms of COVID uh, and waiting until the last possible fucking mo moment to go to, uh, to, to the doctor. And so, of course, you're going to need to be ventilated. You're going to need to be in the ICU because anti-fat bias was what, oh, sorry, Chris, uh, anti-fat bias was what uh, led folks to want to avoid even going to the doctors, uh, the, the healthcare providers in the first place. And so just because there's a relationship that exists between a category and an outcome does not mean that that is a direct cause. Like, Yes, there's a relationship between sexual orientation and depression. Does that mean me being gay is the direct cause of the risk of having depression? No, it does not. There's all sorts of social processes that intermediate that. And so if we think of these things just from a social category to a health outcome, we're of course going to reinforce these bias. All right, should I go to the, our next question? What are your thoughts on how seminal people in the field of weight stigma who still use terms like obesity and obese in their research, um, how should researchers navigate this when there are some facets still in use r related to those terms, but other, other areas, other researchers trying to reclaim words like that? So yeah, I, I guess I'll first, I'll start off with talking about language a little bit. I saw another question about what word should we be using? Is it better to use overweight? Is it better to use fat? And so like, I, first, I think the first thing to really be aware of is that many people consider BMI terms to be stigmatizing, O words, overweight, obese, morbid obesity, horribly stigmatizing terms. And you just have to look into what the meanings of those words actually are to be able to understand that. 
So then the next question is, well, then a solution is, okay, well, let's just put people first. We'll use person first language instead. So instead of seeing obese person, we'll say person with obesity. And I just wanna point out that, that that's not a solution because you're still using the stigmatizing word. Putting the person first doesn't solve this problem at all. And unfortunately, many of our health journals require this first person language to be used, which is incredibly problematic. So then, okay, what's the next possibility to use more neutral based terms like higher body weight, for example, or people in larger bodies? They're very clunky terms and there's problems with those terms as well in terms of the non-specificity of them because we're not talking about fat now anymore. So for me, it's been a very long evolution where now I've just embraced the term fat and I now use the term fat in my writing, whereas at the very beginning, I used the O words, I used the BMI terms, I went through using higher body weight, I went through all of this stuff. And so now when I use the word fat, I define it as this is a descriptor of a person's body, just like thin, tall, and short. And so it's not being used, used in an insulting way. It's being used in a way where we can all understand what the meaning of the word is. And often it requires giving that definition to get people all on the same page. Um, so that's how I'll start this discussion off. I think there's so much more that we can say about it. Um, if it's all right, I'll jump in next. Um, thank you for that. I feel like that just like encompassed lots of very important things. So thank you for saying that. I think for me, I keep thinking about this in relation to a lot of the spaces that I roll in. Um, and these are often eating disorder spaces. And I've noticed that those spaces tend to be quite resistant to the word fat. Um, and it ends up being a huge discussion every time that it comes up. I don't think I've ever given a talk where I've mentioned the word fat um, as a word that people are using to describe themselves. And someone has said, oh, well, you know, I was taught that I shouldn't use that word. Like that's a, a bad word. And so then we go into, you know, how people have reclaimed this word as something that just speaks to a physical descriptor of their body. And this is not a negative characteristic. And when we, you know, decide that it is from our perspective, like that isn't kind of, that's not my right to tell someone whether or not they should call themselves fat. Um, and so I think that, again, it goes back to, I was told that I shouldn't use that word. I think that it goes back to the need to train people to that, you know, there are issues with using the word, the O words that, you know, saying people in larger bodies, which I've used quite a bit in the past, or people in higher weight bodies, like proposes, you know, being over a certain normal, like it kind of centers the normal again and again and again. And I think within eating disorder spaces, we haven't done enough work to unpack what damage that that terminology and those words um, are causing within that sphere. I mean, I could go on for ages about the problems of kind of like combining eating disorders and uh, O word research, but um, I won't do that right now. But I just think basically what I'm saying is I think we need to be listening to how people self-define um, and we really need to be taking that seriously also in kind of journals and advocating for this at the journal level. Like when you're publishing and you use the word fat and a publisher pushes back and says, oh, you know, we don't like to use that word, blah, 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 blah. Like explain why you're using it. I think like we might be kind of disempowered at different stages of our career to feel like we can't push back on a reviewer suggestion like that. But I think the more people that do it, the more that that can kind of become a bit more normalized um, in that setting. And that's kind of one like micro action, I guess, to take kind of some systemic change um, toward something that might be more inclusive. I've had so many thoughts about this too. And um, um, definitely anti-O word, the science of BMI is debunked a million times over. So I have the history of the creation of BMI locked and loaded, ready to share at every single lecture I give, because I am not gonna put up with someone telling me to use those words. Um, however, I also hang out with the fat studies folks and the fat activists. And so I personally identify as small fat and have no problem using that word as a neutral descriptor. However, as a baby, and maybe this is part of my baby scholarness, right, of being timid and not feeling like I can like put stuff forward. Um, my advisor and I kind of brainstormed ways to talk about this in academic writing, because um, if I'm saying these, what seem like extreme notions of humanizing every persons of every body type, um, I don't want to be rejected out of hand for like being over emotional or, I mean, the word fat and overweight and all those are associated not only with these like 
things y'all mentioned, but it's associated with real trauma that people have experienced repeatedly their entire lives. And so uh, knowing that emotional connection, we tried to, we're trying out um, the term weight nonconformity to use in more academic spaces. It's kind of like gender nonconformity. I feel like it makes connections between the fact that you don't choose, like you don't get to just up and change your mind about the way your body is and the, th the thought that we can perpetuates this like thinness norm. Um, so just saying that you're weight non-conforming or you have your weight non-conformity, that's the way that I'm trying to navigate this at this moment. I know I might change my mind in the future, but just trying to bust up into the academic world. Um, that's what I'm pitching right now. And hopefully it will be published soon in an article. So it doesn't exist right now. Don't look it up. <laughs> I think also just sort of to put a bow on the, the conversation that the, the three folks have said so far is like, there are a lot of competing interests in the language that we use. Um, obviously, when we are talking one on one with folks, we want to use the, the preferred language that, that, that they, you know, or the language that they prefer, but it becomes a, a little bit more of a challenge when we think of like, okay, so what language do I use in my broad based approaches in my publishing, in my website, in my, you know, speaking? And because yes, we know that there are, there's absolutely this push to, to reclaim the word fat, just like we reclaim the word queer. You know, what, what used to be pejorative is now trying to be leveraged as uh, a normative uh, descriptor, like we would use like tall or blonde. And like Chris Crandall has this fantastic footnote from Crandall 1994 and his anti-fat attitudes paper. I can still picture it in my head. Like it's uh, footnote one on the first page where it's like, we're using fat here because uh, obesity is medicalizing and other terms create some sort of assumption of what is normative. Um, but at the same time, there actually is literature to suggest that folks that are not researchers don't blush, Chris Crandall, it's fine. Uh, there's, there, but there's, there's research out there to also suggest that folks on the ground, like the people on the ground, push back against the term fat. And so it, it, become, it really becomes this very challenging conversation of where we find that middle ground between folks that are trying to reclaim the, the term fat folks that realize that they, you know, folks that want to advocate for person first language, and then also what people writ large on the ground find comfortable when they're talking about their own weight. But then all of that is against the backdrop of the societal kind of shit that we have to deal with. Like maybe they don't like that term because it's against the backdrop of an anti-fat country. And so it's like having to think through where folks are at with the terminology within the, the framework of probably a strong degree of internalized anti-fat bias. And so it's hard to see fat as a neutral descriptor if you have internalized it as a negative descriptor. Like it's it's just really hard to reconcile those two things. And so I, Paula and I have had this conversation for decades now at this point where we're like on our, our, our language journey and I'm still at the, the higher body weight, lower body weight. I'm at, I'm at the point of um, comparative, because all that does is say that there is a distribution on which weight falls. There's a distribution on which BMIs fall. That's true. That it's just that it's just the fact of the matter is there. There is a distribution. People are, people are higher or lower on weight, on BMI, on all these things. That tends to be where I fall as the trying to find the center of this, like all these different competing um, stakeholders, competing interests and trying your best to make sure that everybody feels like they have a, a, a spot at the table and you're not really like harming anyone if you can. Can I just, sorry, can I just add one? Yeah, thing? go ahead. I think um, what all of this discussion kind of brought together for me is also like, we are imperfect in the terms that we use and we change our mind and we try to do our best and we get told otherwise. and we're responsive to that and it kind of causes this shift in thinking. And I think all of that work is meaningful. Um, it's not to say, like, I think that it's just important that we kind of bring attention to the fact that probably all of us have shifted in the way that we're relating to these words at different times. And I think just in terms of like speaking to this audience of attendees who are gonna be at various stages with their language as well, is like, I think that the thinking about it and the knowing that it's probably gonna change over time and you're gonna have different opinions about it is, 
a process worth doing because even that thinking does some destabilizing work. Um, and for me, that's been really important is not to feel like I have to come up with one term that I'm going to use forever and it's going to be perfect and I'm going to be, you know, perfect in my language use and I'm never going to harm or, you know, do anything like that. Because if I do that, then I, you know, get defensive if someone tells me, oh, I really like don't like that language. It doesn't resonate with me in my body. Um, and I think, yeah, just that openness to kind of shift and change on the basis of kind of what feedback we're getting, what thinking we're doing and how we're critiquing these um, really sticky issues. To follow up, uh, we had a number of comments about intersectionality. So I kind of wanted to bring it back to that. We had a, a comment and a question. Stephanie, thank you so much for talking about the role of racism and anti-fat bias. Can you and the other panelists and or the other panelists talk more about the intersectionality of anti-fat bias and how different groups may have a very different experience with anti-fat bias? It's really complicated. Um, I think there's there's a lot of assumptions even within the world of, I mean, in this academic kind of area where some people think that certain groups have this protective factor and some studies have backed that up where others have not. Like it's not something that I think is very clear cut. Um, yes, there are cultures where a certain like different body types are more in the ideal camp. However, um, because the world itself is so westernized because whiteness is the prevalent um, choice of everything in media, even when that is a norm in your culture, the, the anti-fatness sneaks in is what I'm noticing. And this is all from observation, personal experience, not from any kind of data that I have to back this up, but it's the kind of data that I'm hoping to acquire. So um, we're not talking necessarily about our cultural heritage when we talk to kids about their bodies. We're not talking about the food traditions they bring to the table or how, how those are rich parts of their identity. Um, I always remember this one example of when I was in a, a school placement in my training and this parent came in to chat about her kid being bullied because they, they had a different body type. Like they're from another country. They have like a very different build, but this kid was being bullied by her white friend and like stopped eating at school because of this. And it was just horrific because it didn't occur to me how, um, how out of left field this must seem for this parent, right? Who's immigrated to this country, doesn't necessarily speak English like in a way that you can kind of explain these nuances and this kind of absurd bullying. But I think it is something we have to do a lot more work and a lot more listening to people from different backgrounds to find out how this is really playing out in different places. Would anyone else like to add anything or should I go to our next question? I'll just add, a, uh, I'll just add one thing is that I think this is the fut one future direction for weight bias research to go to really adopt an intersectional lens in a meaningful way. And I'm guilty of this myself, like at, as far as looking at intersectionality in my own work would be only with gender, where I really tried to make the case of like, this is not only a woman's issue, it affects everybody, it affects men too, we need to talk about these things. And now of course, we can talk about this very specific feminist lens in which weight and women has an impact, but let's not ignore men altogether. Um, so I just really want to see we're taking an intersectional approach to us understanding these things. Um, and I'm really, really excited and hopeful that this will be the case. All right, I have a question. This is from someone who is fat and trying to transition careers to study anti-fat bias. And their question is, um, for those panelists who do identify as fat and who are also conducting academic research on anti-fat bias, um, can you talk a little bit about your experiences to the extent that you're comfortable doing that, um, specifically considering the tendency for people who endorse anti-fat bias to perceive fat people as non-experts? That's a hard one. <laughs> I have a few more questions from grad students too that looked really good. So let me get to a few other. Um... I think as far as this in the meantime, I um, I always have a nervousness about speaking to strangers. Like just the, earlier this week, I gave a guest lecture in a class for undergrads and <laughs> putting yourself 
in front of them can be really nerve wracking because you know people want to discount you for a host of things, right? For not looking like them in some way or not looking like their ideal. Um, but I think my, my main thing that's gotten me through it is like a lot of community and therapy and just being able to prepare yourself for the bias that's inevitably going to be there, right? It's like it for black researchers talking about anti-racism, right? Like it's, there's some things that we're not going to change overnight. We just have to do the best to take care of ourselves. But I'm glad you're doing this work. I, I missed part of the question because my brain wandered, but I do want to share that I teach about weight bias in all of my courses and it is my most stressful week of teaching. I've been teaching it for over 10 years and it still is my most stressful week of teaching, even though very rarely does bad stuff happen in terms of there's a troll in the classroom where I'm like disrespected or anything like that. I think part of the way in which I've protected myself is I typically save the content until the end of the semester. And so I've built a relationship with my students. My students come to respect me, seeing as me, me, being, me being very scientifically rigorous, paying attention to methodologies, all these sorts of things. So then when I take them through this like mind warp of like, hey, here's critical weight science, look at weight discrimination, they're like shocked and really, really interested. And so they tend to listen to what I'm saying. And so that's how I've kind of utilized at least my position in relationship with students to have meaningful work in that way. But you know, going cold into a room and just talking about stuff, it really depends upon the climate that's being built at that institution um, and supporting that work. I have a question going back to the research that you all conduct. What best practices do you suggest in centering fat people in research? Um, this questioner is particularly interested in how you navigate centering fat people who might perceive their fatness as immoral or bad or harmful, while keeping in mind that many of these perspectives come from oppressive structures. That's a big one. Um, I think it's really important to acknowledge that you know, participants who might be in a study um, are going to relate to their own bodies in very different ways. And kind of as we've talked about with the use of the language, like in ways that sometimes will kind of align with these kind of dominant um, discourses around what it means to be fat. And I think holding space for that to be that experience that that person is having while not kind of like allowing the study to be like, and everybody was, you know, the worst, <laughs> like not buying into it ourselves, but still holding space for that to be a true experience. Um, I think as I have kind of moved on in my research journey, just thinking about ways of um, ensuring that there's like deep collaboration with um, people who identify along the weight spectrum or whatever you want to call it um, in doing this work is really important. So making sure that you know, if I write about fatness, I'm writing with co-authors who identify as fat as opposed to just doing it myself or, you know, stepping aside in moments where I could um, have otherwise stepped up is important and trying to just center like what's true for participants at that time as well. Um, and again, recognizing that that can shift and change because I think people's relationships to fat and to experiences of fat and fat phobia and weight stigma in the world can shift and change so much over time. And so making sure that when we're writing about it, we represent it as like, what's happening in that moment, as opposed to like, this is going to be true forever and ever. And there's nothing that can be done to change this. Like, I think focusing too on the kind of stories of um, strength and then situating those stories of strength within the, the challenges of the system that exist, um, that allows for some kind of nuance and complexity to coexist. Um, but it is tricky. And I always struggle with having any kind of voice in this space. I mean, I had extensive discussions about even being on this panel in terms of like, do I have anything to say? Like, should I be here? But I chatted with my co-authors and they were like, yeah, we want you to do it. And I'm like, okay, cool. So I'll do it. But I think like these are discussions um, to be had and thinking about who should be speaking is always important and who should be writing is always important. And something that I'm increasingly conscious of the more that I go on in my career and have kind of the privilege that's accompanied by having a full-time academic position, that sort of thing. I don't know if that really answered the question, but I think being thoughtful about how people are identifying the fact that it doesn't stay forever and we need to be thinking about these things uh, situationally and contextually.
I have another question. This is actually about Dr. Brochu's research. So this is from a trainee clinical psychologist in the UK. Um, this person is very excited to come across your research because it feels like there are minimal conversations happening at training centers in the UK. How have you found trying to address bias in trainees or clinical, uh, clinical psychologists and the sustainability of reduction in bias? Minimal conversations everywhere in the United States too. Um, you know, it really is almost starting from square one and just like really combating some of the myths and assumptions about weight and health. So in the teaching that I do, I really take a very critical weight science kind of perspective, introducing students to weight inclusive healthcare approaches, what that means and what it looks like, and then really focusing on weight stigma and discrimination, how pervasive it is and how harmful it is. So at least in my teaching, like clinical psychology and school psychology doctoral students, they can get can really get on board with the idea of, well, how can I minimize the bias that I'm bringing into the room on the basis of weight? So increasing awareness about that stuff. And you know, how might I be unwittingly perpetuating this bias when I'm not even thinking about it? And then how can I provide the best care to my clients for whatever issues it is that they're coming in for? Um, so like, it's so easy to wrap it up like this in a neat little bow, but it's a lot of information, a lot of processing. And, you know, one course, one class isn't enough. Uh, so like, now that I'm more established in my position at, at NOVA, I'm really trying to think about how can I make this be something that like students are coming into over and over again, rather than a one shot, now you're done kind of idea, because they're going back to their other courses, they're going back to their clinical supervision, where the person might not share this sort of weight inclusive stigma informed kind of perspective. So it's a challenge, but it's an exciting one. I have another few questions from people who are in grad school, for example, in social work and haven't heard about weight bias. How do they advocate for systemic and structural changes in their own education? And then also for people who are interested in, in this work, how do they connect with other researchers who are looking at fat attitudes, weight stigma, um, et cetera? I feel like I can tackle the second point about how to connect with folks uh, easier, only because we have the International Weight Stigma Conference. Uh, I'm no longer on the steering committee for this, but uh, this has been spearheaded by and uh, and Angela Meadows for the past ooh, seven years now, I think. Um, so it is sort of this fantastic interdisciplinary group of folks that are interested in all things weight stigma, whether it be from the sort of the perceiver side of like, you know, why are people biased? What factors predict that? How do we intervene? To folks more on my side of the equation that are like, what are the consequences of being a target of that or worrying about being a target of that? And what I love is it brings together people from all sorts of disciplines that are not just psychology, it's educational, you know, folks in education, folks in sociology, folks in critical studies, folks in fat studies. This is where I believe where I first met An uh, Andrea, um, I think, and I uh, maybe four years ago. And so what it's really does a fantastic job of doing is just de-siloing this type of research. Like it breaks down those silos because, you know, there's probably 15 or 20 different disciplines re represented in the 120 people that are in that room. And I think it can be just a fantastic opportunity to really find your like-minded folks that are interested in these uh, these questions, you know, at least from the sort of the, the research standpoint. And actually, even from folks that are interested in translating what we're doing there to the policy point of view or to sort of non-traditional academic uh, sort of applications of it. And I think it's just stigmaconference.com. I think is actually somehow what Angela ended up getting. So I think the stigmaconference.com will get you to uh, that website. I think from the training perspective, from the student perspective, as I still am one, um, then I'm gonna acknowledge that this has a lot to do with the privileges and dynamics you have in your own program because I have plenty of friends who can't bring what is seen as extreme or like liberal ideas to the table in the same way that I've been able to. Like I have two male advisors who have no idea about anything about weight bias and they have supported me 100% on this journey. And that's such a privilege. So it's been cool to be able to bring it 
to my department, bring it up in classes, write my papers about things. Um, and whatever agency you have as a grad student, it, and it varies so much, you can try to insert your interests in those ways and you can connect it to the work you're doing. And I'm certain like as a social work student, there are lots of ways to connect these systemic issues to the work you're doing. So sometimes it's small. And if you're if you have a good relationship with your faculty, if they are people open to feedback, that's another way to bring it to their attention, to, to tell them, you know, this class, this would fit really well as part of this curriculum. Like, can we bring it up or something like that? Um, or, you know, start a podcast club. That's what our <laughs> diversity and inclusion association is doing. Our next um, meeting is about Sabrina Strings episode on food psych. So there's other ways to just expose people. I also like Twitter. <laughs> I mean, I hate Twitter for some reasons because it is a place where trolls abound, but also it's a great place to connect with people. Um, and often, well, I guess I've met most of the people in my kind of scholarly slash activist life through either Twitter and or conferences. And typically if I go to a conference, someone's like, oh, you're Andrea from Twitter. That's where I know you from. And then it's a really awkward exchange because I'm a lot less like outgoing in person than I appear on Twitter. Um, but it is a great way to kind of connect with people. It's hard to have really deep nuanced conversations there at times. And I think especially around this kind of stuff, I'm very aware that I tend to get a lot less hate um, on those spaces than um, some other people because of the privileges that I embody. Um, so I guess tread carefully, but it can be a good way to at least make like a first um, encounter with someone who's doing this type of work. And then maybe you can bring some of those conversations offline or onto email or Zoom um, in this time. But I do miss those kind of in-person conference opportunities because that was always a fantastic place to like really build community and be in a space with each other. And the Stigma Conference, the Weight Stigma Conference was always fantastic for that. There's also um, a Fat Studies Conference um, here in New Zealand by Kat Pause that's fantastic as well um, and that moved online um, in COVID times and was really awesome to watch. I also recommend Facebook groups like Fat Studies. It's a very safe space. I guess one thing that we didn't tackle as a panel is like how we ad uh, address these things for folks that are in programs that want to like MSW programs that are uh, not having exposure to this and so I, I wish I had like super like helpful uh, suggestions in, in this realm, but like one could just be recommending specific speakers if there is like a speaker series, like or folks that are doing colloquia, because it, you know, you might have to baby step your department into these conversations. And like I've said to folks many, many, many times, like, you know, even two steps forward and one step back is a step forward. Um, and when we're fighting against these very strong sort of systemic forces that do not want these conversations to happen in these particular spaces, whether it's public health or social work or medicine, just a pushing it a little bit further is better than never having had that conversation. And so if you can, you know, if you know that you have a colloquium series, like try to, you know, have Stephanie Campbell out to talk to you, like just bring bring the folks out there that are that have the message you want the rest of people to hear. At a very minimum, you get to hear Stephanie Campbell talk to you one on one. Um, and, uh, you know, hopefully what you do is you kind of push the conversation or at least get people to start thinking a little bit differently about the ways in which maybe the, the relationship between weight and health or maybe recognizing that weight stigma is pervasive in a lot of these fields and has all sorts of implications for how you execute your job in those fields. Like it affects how you are a clinician, it affects how you enact social work, you know? So just planting those seeds that maybe next year, then you'll be like, well, maybe we can get together a, a weight bias course in, you know, in the department. Like uh, Kendra Sonneville has a weight bias course in the nutrition department at the University of Michigan now because she advocated for implementing those types of courses and just moving it a little bit forward is still moving it forward. Yeah, so like students, if you're able and you have like the choice over what topics you'd pick for your assignments, write about this for your papers or give presentations on it. And then instructors, if you're teaching anything on health, please talk about weight discrimination. If you're talking about anything related to diversity, please add body weight, size and shape to the information that you cover. Um, we know from the research literature and like analyses of textbooks and course syllabi and all this kind of stuff that weight bias is overlooked. It's overlooked as an aspect of 
um, diversity. And if it is talked about in like health courses at all, it typically comes from a very individualized, medicalized, stigmatizing sort of perspective. So there's a lot of space here, I think, to provide really helpful, useful, informative information to students. We just got a question in, um, which I thought was um, really great. Do panelists have a go-to place, article, book, et cetera, to signpost people who completely dispute weight stigma or health bias and need some hard hitting, simply explained data? Tilka et al, Journal of Obesity on Weight Inclusive Health. I am obsessed with podcasts. I am an addict and I do have a problem. And I think that is one really accessible way to get some of this information. Um, some of them have a lot more data than others. The new one I saw mentioned in the chat, a uh, newer one is maintenance phase which has Aubrey Gordon and another person. Um, Christy Harrison's food psych has just a range of topics across all kinds of different identities and, and things really extensively um, researched. And I can also share, this is an imperfect and in progress resource sheet, but I'll link it in the chat as well. And I'll share all of these, everything that people are typing into the chat, I will share all of these resources in an email after our webinar. So you'll have it all in one place. Um, I wanted to ask, we're getting so many questions. It's crazy. It's wonderful, wonderful, crazy. Um, there was a great question about how to address fat phobia in person. Um, I took a great microaggression workshop with Nicole Buchanan a few years ago, and it was so helpful to actually interact in person and try out different scenarios with people. So if, if someone encounters anti-fat bias in real life, how would you suggest they address it? I think a lot of that is gonna depend on how safe you feel a lot of the time. I just wanna acknowledge that sometimes it's not necessarily safe to kind of call that into the room. Um, so I wouldn't want anyone to feel like they had to kind of like go into it if it wasn't a space where they felt like they could. So I think disengaging is an option um, if you can. Um, I think if you do occupy a position of relative privilege and you feel comfortable kind of going into that chat, I think it can be a moment of kind of like a micro teaching moment um, in a way like I if somebody kind of says something I'll kind of pause and say like is that really what you mean or you know kind of use that as a moment to kind of unpack some of the assumptions that they might be bringing to the table and say you know actually like BMI is a really flawed metric or whatever it is um, that's coming into the space or you know like do you really mean what you're saying about that piece of cake like all of these little things like can kind of come in to play but I think I wouldn't want to yeah, assume that my response is going to be the same. Um, also, depending on where I'm at on the day, you know what I mean? Like, I think there are also moments where someone is, um, I forget who it was that says reachable and teachable. And I feel horrible that I can't remember who that was. It's one of those moments where you're like, what's the citation? Um, but somebody says like, you know, they're reachable and teachable people. And then there are those who you maybe just want to disengage with because it's just going to be really like personally upsetting. So I think the response varies depending on who you're talking to and where you're at. I've gotten a few questions about policy and being the policy person here, I of course want to ask you all about policy. So um, we had one question uh, that asked, do any of the panelists have tips on bridging the academic governmental divide in terms of introducing a weight inclusive lens to local, state, federal government? Um, and then more broadly, do you have uh, recommendations for policymakers? I guess my, my recommendation for policymakers would be to stop centering everything around weight, uh, like in just full stop, just like, you know, so, so much of uh, uh, health related policy at the governmental level uh, is, even if it talks about like behavior change or whatever, is all about like, well, but then we need to reach a certain BMI, like Stephanie just said, abolish the BMI, like burn it, burn it, burn it with like a fire, just burn it down. Um, but just really centering, like getting rid of that as a, as a center uh, for any sort of health-related policy, any sort of 
uh, recommendations for funding, any sort of things related to uh, how we yoke, at least in the United States, health insurance costs. Like you can still legally yoke uh, someone's health insurance costs to their BMI or their willingness or not willingness to engage in weight loss programs, and that's fucked up. Um, and so we should be thinking about removing that. Um, I am so we have a paper on uh, advocating for weight inclusive health policies. I will say I am not the health policy expert on that paper. Jocelyn Smith, uh, formerly of NIDA, is the expert on that. So engaging with folks like Jocelyn, who has you know, really spent a lot of her career trying to figure out ways we can translate social science research into you know, changes in policy. Um, looking to places like uh, Iceland, like Reykjavik, for example, like one of the only places that has uh, discrimination protection for weight um, as a protected class that is not rooted in disability, but instead rooted in social justice. And the the, the, the Reykjavik city charter, when you read it about like the ways in which these different classes are protected is fantastic and should be a standard that we should apply across the board. In, in, in the United States, I think we have two states that now consider weight as a protected class. It's Michigan and it's Washington. And then a few municipalities, I think San Francisco probably. Um, but really thinking through rooting this protection in social justice and rooting uh, just actually, you know, trying to advocate for ways that um, consider weight as a protected class because like we've talked about here for an hour, weight-based discrimination is pervasive, it's nasty, it's got impacts, it's, it's terrible, and yet it still seems to be just rampant and no one wants to do anything about it. I can move to our next question. Um, one of our questioners was interested in um, how you think about the position of your work in relation to fat acti activism. I believe Stephanie, you talked a little bit about this earlier. Oh, I think everything I'm doing is fat, <laughs> fat activism. I think there's, uh, I, I love the examples I've had to look at from other researchers who have been like scholar activists, right? Especially within the anti-racism um, world of psychology. Um, so there's so much work to still do. But I think every time we talk about bias, every time we work towards informing people the harm of bias and the real consequences of this, and every time I can try to like root the seed of body liberation into somebody, be it a client or a student, I see that as activism. And so I don't have like any cute concrete things other than I play in an activist marching band and that's pretty concrete, but we don't have any fat specific tunes yet. I think um, for me, I like to do my kind of research and advocacy work kind of in concert, like I consider them together, like similarly to Stephanie saying, like all of this kind of fits into that, but there is kind of a role for, you know, doing stuff in different types of registers of language, I guess, depending on the audience that you're aiming it toward. So I think like, I'm like, I know Twitter activism is not the whole thing, but I think like, you know, just saying stuff on Twitter is like a micro intervention. I guess I'm really big on the micro interventions today, but I think, you know, just raising the question um, that's advocacy. I think, yeah, doing things like bringing it into courses is also like a kind of advocacy in a way because it's exposing a greater number of people to this work. I think, um, you know, signal boosting um, people that you want people to listen to is a piece of advocacy, whether that's on social media or, you know, in a course syllabus or whatever it is. Like, I think all of those things are seem like they might be small, but they are larger actions at times and they kind of add up and build to something. And then I think, yeah, advocating more kind of specifically for policy change or, you know, shifts within a particular field. So within the eating disorder field, like, um, you know, speaking up if something is like super fat phobic in the way that it's oriented and kind of inviting that as a moment of change. I think all of this kind of entwines together to create um, some conditions for movement, um, at least a little bit um, towards something that's more um, inclusive and open. I have a question. Um, I've seen a few questions about the literature. What, um, for all of our panelists, what do you see as the biggest gaps in the literature on weight stigma? Or if you want to think of it more broadly, where do you see the direction of this field of study going or, or the potential directions it could take? <laughs> 
Well, one, intersectionality, um, but two would be, let's stop focusing on weight and let's consider the social experience of weight. So let's look at weight stigma, weight discrimination, weight stigma concerns, weight bias internalization, all of these things, because it's probably the social experience of weight that really, really matters here. Um, it, it's not the weight, it's the social experience of it. Yeah, I want to echo 100% what Paula said there, and especially getting folks outside of the social sciences to take that lens. Like we've definitely, the social science uh, has taken that lens that it's not weight, that the, you know that this is a socially mediated process, but the folks that are in medicine still are just like, bloop, here's a thing, here's a BMI category that predicts health. And it's, you know, terrible paper. Um, I will say one of the things that I want our field to do is to focus more on resilience and to think about how people can be active agents in pushing back against a fat phobic society. Like I, and I'm just as guilty of this. I've spent the past 10 years of my life documenting the shit end of the stick that comes along with being a target of weight stigma. And it's getting old in terms of like only focusing on that. I want us to start thinking about, okay, but what are the ways in which people can, can resist? What are the ways that people can confront? What are the ways that people can be more resilient in the face of these social, mis these social experiences? Because like I said earlier, I think uh, like, we want to change societal bias, but that is not going to happen overnight. So we need to make sure that folks are equipped with the resources to feel ready to be resilient and resist in the face of, uh, you know, living in our terribly fat phobic society. Um, this is, I think, oh, oh, sorry, go for it, Stephanie, you go first. No, no, it's all you. Go. <laughs> Darn, okay. Um, I think this is my bias, but we need things in schools. We need teachers to be educated. We need administrators to be aware of the effects of this. We need schools to be a point of intervention because they are seeing a ton of kids that aren't gonna have access to um, you know, specific care or any kind of intervention for eating disorders. Like they just don't have that resource. I think school is a place where in the future we can make a huge difference. And this is happening in other places, like I mentioned, but the US needs to get its crap together. Um, this is just the way that I like to see research done, I guess, but I'd love to see more kind of fully collaborative co-designed and um, arts-based research on these topics. I think I love love a good survey. Um, you know, stats are super convincing um, in some contexts, but I think like really fully co-designed um, research with people who are experiencing um, these issues um, is really important. And I think that particularly in the medical sphere, kind of drawing on other kind of um, co-designed research will be really important to avoid that kind of like, I think along the lines of that kind of person first languagey type stuff, there can be like this kind of like benevolent kind of frame that like is nice on the surface, but doesn't actually do justice to the experiences people are having. And I think co-design can be a way to kind of combat that by inviting um, people to share their experiences in the design of research itself and the conduct of research itself through, you know, research questions to recruitment to analysis the whole way through um, to actually design services and policies and programs that work for um, different people who live in larger bodies or fat people or whatever they want to refer to themselves as. All right, and I realize we're kind of butting up against the end of our time together, but I have perhaps one more question and then also if you would like to add anything to that. Um, we got um, a number of questions about intervention. So um, are there any good groups or programs that are doing good work in regard to anti-fat bias that we should be aware of? And there are there groups that are doing harmful work and that we should definitely not be listening to? I'd say not listen to the medical establishment broadly, but uh, maybe that's not as helpful. Uh, <laughs> maybe other folks have better suggestions in terms of folks to listen to. I highly recommend Be Nourished. Check them out online. Really great resources, really great community, and you can get training through there. So they're all focused on body trust. I highly, highly recommend. I think there are, um, you know, a group within the weight bias world where people are really focused on social justice. And I think 
start there if they're not having these kinds of ideologies like Lindo Bacon and, and folks who write about this from a justice equity perspective, the intervention is probably not <laughs> serving folks well. I think there's also this, um, you know, we don't have a top-down version of this, especially in the, in the US, um, but I've recently talked to someone like Dr. Lori Cooper Stoll is um, a sociologist who is really passionate about getting this within the po ed policy and having this kind of intervention at the at the level of yes we have to have wellness training in our schools we have to have some language but what can we do to make that not biased what can we do to kind of free that from these stigmatized ideas of what what wellness is so i think the the micro macro intervention is like deconstruct this notion of wellness and how it's currently conceptualized and perpetuated especially on social media um, the way that diet culture has co-opted everything that's supposed to be good for you or your, for your well-being is actually very harmful. And I'm learning this more and more working with teenagers who have eating concerns and what their normal is. And it's something that is so big. It's, it sounds like a crazy intervention, but the fact of like being more critical about health, anything that you read or hear about is step one. A good litmus test of whether the intervention is helpful or harmful would be what's its goal if it's focusing on weight loss it's probably harmful and you're going to want to avoid it. And or if the program has the language around things that are like well being and uh, lifestyle changes, but then the actual outcome that they're hiding is weight loss. <laughs> Noom. Um, so yeah, just I just want to second both of those. Thank you so much to all of you. I got so much out of this conversation. And I think judging from all the comments we're getting, a lot of people in attendance are also getting a lot out of this conversation. So um, what I'll do is I will pull together all of the resources that were mentioned. And, and if the panelists want to email me any additional resources, I'll pull that all together in an email to send it to everyone who was on the um, webinar today. I want to thank Dr. Asia Eaton, who's the co-chair of our communications committee for putting together this awesome panel. Thank you so much, Asia. And um, thank you to you all for attending. I am so delighted that you're all here with us. And um, hopefully you'll be able to join us for future webinars. So thank you so much. And thank you to our amazing panelists. Thank you, Asia. Thank you, Sarah. And I do want to add one more thing. Um, I hate to do this, but I do want to just like state explicitly that we need better institutional support from APA. They do not explicitly acknowledge weight, body size, shape at all in their diversity statements. APA needs to step up and do that. And I also just want to say that SPICI has a big role to play here as well. We should have SPICI position statements about weight inclusive care that are available online so that people can get additional resources as well. That's just available on SPICI. And, you know, back in 2011, 2012, we have some position statements on the SPICI board, um, SPICI website that are very weight normative, linking pediatric obesity to digital gaming. It's all about calories in, calories out. We don't want that legacy anymore. I think we have to update the kind of information that we're providing to members. You're here. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you.